Thank you, our viewers, for joining us. I'm Karaga Borins, and we're coming to you live from the Kampala Serena International Conference Center. We are going to have an eccentric discussion about a very pertinent issue that regards the nation at large, but of course focused on two communities in our country. Let's watch this, and then we'll come back. Public expectations worldwide regarding the role of the state in providing public goods and services are on the increase and will possibly remain so. Legitimate governments are run on institutionally strong, efficient, effective systems anchored on publicly determined, predictable, and increasingly rational rules of behavior. In such a system, the public service becomes a central pillar of the government as it regulates, administers, executes, mediates, invests, and delivers the construction, operations, maintenance, and servicing of service delivery infrastructure, and ensures that the public service machinery is oriented to diligently serve the citizens. The government of Uganda has the obligation to provide services to its citizens and to steer economic growth and development through the provision of public services. There is no more reality that typifies the challenges and deficiencies of the public service efforts in Uganda than in rural regions of this nation. As a microcosmic reference, the Renzori sub-region requires lots of improvements in ensuring that its people receive and enjoy the public services that are due to them. This region is consistent of seven districts named as Kabarole, Kasese, Bundubujo, Chenjojo, Chegegwa, Kamwenge, and Ntoroko. For this particular discussion, our focus is going to be majorly narrowed on the pastoral communities of Ntoroko and Kasese districts. These districts are at the receiving end of the development progress so far experienced in the rest of the country. This extreme disparity represented in these two districts juxtaposed to the rest of the country districts is hard to pinpoint what exactly its cause is, whether it's politics or sheer coincidence. However, there are several peculiarities to these two districts. They have pastoralist communities which are nomadic in their economic and social configuration, and the terrain is extremely difficult because of its mountainous nature. Kasese district is multi-ethnic with many people of different ethnic backgrounds, amounting to a population of over 700,000 people. It was formed in 1974 under the provincial administration of Renzori district that was carved out of Kabarole district. Prior to this, it was part of Toro Kingdom that comprised the present districts of Bundibujo, Kabarole, Chenjojo, Kamwenge, and Kasese. Five constituencies, 23 rural sub-counties, three town councils, and one municipality which has three divisions. Ntoroko became a district effective July 2010 following the creation of new districts by the Parliament of Uganda. It was carved out of Bundibujo district and is part of the Toro Kingdom. Besides sharing similar peculiarities, these two districts are also experiencing similar challenges that are impeding their economic, social and infrastructure development. The findings about the plight of the pastoral communities are quite touching. As you know very well that uh, the, the pastoral communities have been used to moving from one place to another in search of pasture, but you know with the the land becoming scarce each day, the, the, the culture now has changed. So the many pastoral communities have been forced to settle down within a, a given environment. And uh, historically, because of the movement of these pastoral communities, some of the services like the health units, the schools, were not planned for uh, properly. And uh, now it's high time that uh, we drive the attention of government into specifically looking at uh, the young people and also the women who suffer when it comes to issues of health within the pastoral environments. The issues of Untoroko and Kasese, you will find them in Karamoja, you will find them in, uh, in Teso, in anywhere where they, they look after cows. These districts are facing alienation from receiving public service attention and so many reasons are being cited by policymakers. These are hard to reach areas and the, the, the technocrats of government, the experts uh, who should provide services, they are uh, on high demand. So very few would prefer to go and settle in such a hostile environments. Sometimes the climate is so hostile so people cannot manage. But at the same time, you don't have housing facilities like how it is seen 
when you are a staff and you are given a job where there are no houses, what do you do? You will remain on paper and you will not have your physical presence in an area. The education services are very appalling. Find that P1 to P6 sit on the floor. Children write exams on the ground. Supposing they were uplifted a bit, they would be better. They would perform like schools within Central or any other good performing school. So this, the same challenges in Toroko are the same challenges we have in, in, in my area. Questions have been raised to find out what really the problem is as regards the prioritization of these areas in at least receiving the basic social services due to them like health and education. It is the money diverting the priorities. I raised this with the president. I raised this with the PAs of the Minister of Health. I raised this with the Committee of, uh, of Health in Parliament. They gave me the budget from 300 million to 1 billion and government has released all these monies to the district and rehabilitation is going on. Unfortunately, at the district level, you'll find the money that went there for first quarter, 300 million, they have diverted it. As an endeavor to shed a spotlight on these two peculiar districts, NTV in partnership with Cabarole Research and Resources Center have teamed up to bring you this discussion on how we as a nation can ensure reasonable access and acceptable quality of health and education services in these pastoral communities of Ntoroko and Kasese. Follow us on our Facebook and Twitter platforms as to interact with the discussion. You are welcome. And we're delighted from wherever you're watching. Here in Kampala, across the country and all over the world, I'm Karagab Bodwins. And so let's get started. I have a resplendent panel of public servants in this realm, especially regarding the areas that are being mentioned in this introduction. That is in Toroko and Kasese and, of course, the uh, sub-region of Renzori. So right at the extreme end uh, on this panel, I have Honorable Buan Tekamwa Gafa. He's a member of parliament, uh, Kasambia County, part of the Parliamentary Forum on Quality Health. You're welcome, Mr. Gaffa. Thank you so much. Good evening, viewers. Nice to see you, indeed. And uh, in the middle, I have Mr. Muzinduki Patrick, head of government, government policy and advocacy at KRC, the partner that we are having with this discussion. You're welcome, Patrick. Thank you. Good evening, viewers. Indeed. And uh, right in next to me, I have Mr. Bimbona Simon, the chief administrative officer, Kao of Ntoroko District. Simon, you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening, viewers. Mm -hmm. All right, so straight, let me get to you, Patrick. Uh, just briefly, let us know uh, what, because we need to first set into perspective, yeah, you're mm -hmm. very, really concerned about this uh, region, the, this particular area. Uh, what is Kabarore Research and Resources Center, and what does it do? How are you involved in the advocacy, especially of uh, uplifting these communities, and just uh, to set us off uh, on this discussion? Yeah, Cabral Research and Res uh, Resource Center is an organization mm -hmm. uh, based in Fort Porto and yep. we are operating in uh, uh, eight districts mm -hmm. of Renzo region and we are also operating in parts of uh, Kevale, Kakumiro mm -hmm. and also Movende. So we do work to do with research, advocacy and community development. We partner with the local governments, we partner with the CSOs to make sure that the lives of the people are able to improve. And uh, in doing all this, we have uh, several components. We support farmers to increase the, uh, their incomes, but also work with the communities to make sure that the, there is access to quality services, especially in the areas of agriculture, health, and education. Mm -hmm. So in this perspective, um, uh, through our arm of research, we're able to do an assessment on the communities of Ntoroka and uh, Kasese, especially giving a focus of uh, women and the youth that are living in the pastoral communities. So you are aware that the, these are unique communities. They are Ugandans. They have rights like any other citizen. But when it comes to the planning process, the ministries use a lot of formulas, mm. especially in the population distribution. And yet you find in the communities in Toroko, especially in the pastoral communities, the population is so scattered. So when you say you are going to have a radius of uh, uh, five kilometers, from one health facility to another, you find the population in, in Toroko, 
Kasese, but also all pastoral communities in Uganda, that formula doesn't work. Mm. And the, the impact has been so huge. Uh, the desensitization policy, for instance, the creation of districts were meant to deliver services near to the people. But when you look at Intoroko, which was created in 2010, you don't see more health facilities come into place. And people are trekking long distances. So we have been bringing out the perspective of youth and women, because when you combine them, they form the biggest part of the population mm. and they are the most vulnerable. Mm. So when we went deeper, we found out that the women are dying while giving birth. They cannot walk long distances. In fact, some of them are opting to deliver from churches. Others, are the ambulance system is quite weak. And when you look at the, the policy, it says at least every sub-county should have a health center three. But when it comes to Toroko, you find there are only two health center threes. And uh, when you look at the, each district is supposed to have a hospital, mm -hmm. there is only a health center four in Karugutu. So when you look at the, all the sub-counties in total, there are around ten. So ten, six <coughs> sub-counties and uh, four town councils, people are moving long distances. But what are they doing in terms of the coping strategies? Others would say to stay home so that the nature, the body immunity is able mm. to overcome that challenge. So we have seen, uh, for instance, uh, when it comes to drugs, mm. there is a quite... Yeah, a Patrick, I'm mm. coming to that for okay. the detailed part of the discussion. Yeah. Yeah. This, was, uh, this is, uh, you're painting a very sad, poignant yeah. uh, situation in those districts. And mm. it's been reflected even there. Introduction. Now let me get to, to the MP, uh, mm -hmm. Honorable Gaffa. So according to the Civil Society Budget Advocacy Group, uh, CISBAG, it is involved in budget making uh, and in 2017-2018, uh, they cited out such issues that the health structures are non-functional um, in most districts of Rinzoi sub-region. This, among other cases, was evident during the recent redistribution of uh, mosquito nets and both at the national and local levels. Uh, of course, there is limited funding to the education sector, especially uh, on non-wage recurrent and development expenditures. Uh, and when, when you look at the picture, Kasese district has uh, a population of about 694,000 people, and 86% of those people are actually below 40 years, which is incredible, uh, quite hope-giving, but quite sad if you hear what is the reality on the ground. So what, what's the policy focus of government? You, of course, Parliament is involved with government. Uh, the policy focus of government towards ensuring satisfactory and sustainable services delivery in the hard to reach areas of Uganda, especially these two districts that we're talking about. I think before we can proceed, we, we need to first get to know what went wrong. Okay. Because when you try to see previously in, in, in the early 70s or 60s, health, both health and, um, uh, uh, and education sectors we are doing well. Much as we are discussing about Kasese and Intoroko, mm. nobody should deceive Ugandans that each and every part of the country, actually these sectors are doing well. Mm. They are rotting. The government policy is very good on paper. For example, they say every constituency is supposed to have a health center for where we are supposed to be having at least a doctor who can even attend to these mothers. Mm -hmm. But my constituency, Kasambia, with a total population of 230, mm -hmm. we don't have a health center for. And Her you're quite a vocal MP. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm vocal. <laughs> and and, you, know, I, and yeah. you know what they say? They say that because maybe some people <coughs> think that you're vocal, yeah. they, they cannot bring. <laughs> but then... When we talk about uh, health center threes, mm. every sub-county, it is a government policy. Well stipulated. It's supposed to have at least a health center three. Mm. I have five sub-counties, but all, uh, all the th I don't have two health center threes. Mm. The health center twos, of course, the policy was changed. We got schools. When we look at schools, every sub-county is supposed to be having a government-aided school, U U USE. But when we... It comes to my place at the moment. There is a sub count I don't have there, a government aided school. A pr um, it is a government policy that every parish should have a primary school. Mm. But you come on ground, 
there are very many parishes. I have 33. But out of 33, nine out of them, they don't have these uh, primary schools. And the distance is so big, as I've told you, even the population. So on, on paper, actually, when they are talking and even according to our manifesto, NRM manifesto, mm. you feel everything is fine. But on the ground, things are worsening. So we need to find out exactly what went wrong. Where is the problem? To me, of which I would think, mm -hmm. the political will is completely lacking. Mm -hmm. When you hear whatever we are discussing in parliament, even our president himself tells you that I need to concentrate on roads, the infra infrastructure of roads. Mm -hmm. Then afterwards, that's when other things will come. But why should yes. you give us ro roads when we don't have uh, 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 we, we, are not, we are not doing well. Yeah. So okay. you can see they are concentrating on things which you may call filthy, mm. yes. but they are very, very important, but not very urgent mm. to the population. All right. And so we'll come, okay. we're going to expand the discussion. Let me first bring in uh, uh, Simon, because I, I need to, to first have this uh, segment mm. utilized appropriately. So now I, I, I'll have a district uh, map of Ntoroko dis uh, displayed here just to see the distribution of the population. And it is cited in the 2016 and 2017 uh, Education Ministerial Joint Sector reports, yeah, uh, uh, Simon, that <coughs> there is inadequate funding to the education sector, inadequate supervision of government-aided and private schools, high rates of uh, school dropouts, of course, is in still government-aided schools, and there are low staffing levels in most health facilities. So we, we need to understand, and Toroko actually has the same, almost the same, um, uh, population statistics because 86 percent still of the people uh, who are below 40 percent are the same in Kasese. So the population distribution is almost the same. So what's the situation on ground? You are the representative of, uh, uh, of UACAL, representative on Toroko. So what is the situation on the ground? Um, Just briefly about uh, uh, three minutes then we'll go into another segment. In Toroko, as a distal course, is uh, having similar challenges like in other district. Uh, out of the 10 lower local governments, we have uh, four town councils and six sub-counties. Uh, in terms of secondary schools, mm -hmm. we have only three. So if the policy, uh, as per the policy, we are supposed to be having around 10. Yeah, and because the, the, children, the, the children who are under 9 years are 22,847. Those who are under 19 years are 16,500. So if you're talking about only three schools. So we school. have only three <laughs> secondary schools. Yes. And when it comes to primary schools, we have 37 government-aided primary schools. Mm -hmm. But we have 48 parishes, meaning that we have a gap of 11 schools. If we are to say that a parish, uh, a school per parish. So those are challenges. Then when you look at um, funding, uh, we get uh, around five million per term, mm -hmm. per quarter. Actually now it is coming to Tamale for school inspection and monitoring. Mm -hmm. And of course, given the uh, uh, wide area uh, between each school, we find that this amount of money is not actually adequate. So those are the challenges. The same thing with Hellas. Hellas we have uh, six health centers, one health center four, three health center series, and then uh, two health center two. Mm -hmm. And then there's one uh, uh, private, uh, not for profit, mm -hmm. which receives government funding. So there are some areas which don't have any health center at all, four of them. So they see the gap in terms of uh, the policy, mm -hmm. in terms of health and education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, and, and uh, I'll just, the, the cows, how are cows appointed? Just briefly, how do they get to office? Are they political appointments? Are they publicly? How? Yeah, cows are civil servants. Okay, because civil servants. They're they're the, public the, central the public service. All right, so they're representatives they represent of the central, the, government. the central government. All right, wonderful. So when we come back, Patrick, I'm going mm. to get straight to you, and uh, I, I need us to understand uh, what government and local authorities are doing right, perhaps, because we mm -hmm. need to have a balanced sort of uh, reflection and what needs to be improved in that regard. Mm -hmm. And our viewers, just on that note, let's go for a short break and we'll be back and re-engage the discussion.
10 out of 10. Thank you. This also gets a 10. Should we see the toilet now? Sure. This gets just one. It is clean. But not perfect. Better than my cleaners? Impossible. Challenge. Try the new Hapik 10X. Compared to ordinary cleaners, Hapik stick formulation removes yellow stains 10 times better, giving you a sparkling clean toilet. Wow. Now you also take the, the Hapik 10X Challenge. Now, the Airtel 4G Wi Fi is here. Crazy speed, instant downloads, chop chop uploads, <laughs> videos, they don't even buffer. And the best part is the Airtel Wi Fi can connect up to 10 users on the internet at the same time. Absolute value for money. Pay 90,000 shillings for an Airtel Wi Fi and get 2 GB free, valid for a month. Dell Star 175 Star 9 Hash to activate free data. Terms and conditions apply. Airtel, the smartphone network. Thank you for keeping with us. I'm Karagawa Baldwins and very delighted indeed that you choose us as to be your number one station. And we are discussing a very quite unique issue that is of public concern but is a microcosm of what is going on around the nation, and that is the district of Ntoroko and Kasese. And I have a very magnificent panel of gentlemen who are dealing with this particular matter. And uh, so, Patrick, uh, just in, as you, we were trying to have an introduction on this uh, aspect, so according to Uganda National Population and Housing Census, uh, you have uh, six, there's a reflection, this is what you was 2014 provided, that the, about 84% of the six to 12 years uh, pupils or mm. children are attending primary school and about 11.2 percent are not attending school at all that is 22,467 uh, people you're talking about mm. now uh, persons aged between 13 to 18 that are attending uh, secondary school are 29.8 percent of the entire hundred that is the impression and uh, then you have only 1.4% of persons aged 20 years and above whose highest level of education was completed as a level. Pretty an appalling <laughs> reflection of a social accomplishment in terms of education. So in your assessment as a researcher, we, we need to give a reflected, a, a, a balanced kind of reflection. What is government or what are the government authorities, both local and the central, doing right so far? Okay, mm -hmm. and what are they missing that needs to be improved? Just in about three minutes. Okay, thank you, Bordens. And mm -hmm. uh, for me, I would still say that uh, the policies and the laws that are in place are fantastic. So that's a good. When you th that's look a at good the part. constitution, it says there shouldn't be any discrimination. Mm -hmm. All Ugandans should have right to education, right to health, and be able to access services. The law is very clear. When you go to NRM manifesto, it has plated. All of the nature of services that have to be provided in the health, education, agriculture, and all of that. They even came up with a very good model for, for a model on how households can be able to get income. But when we are doing the assessments, we're able to discuss what really went wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we need to really to, to spend a lot of time. In fact, when Honorable Gaffo was trying to discuss, he was somehow lamenting and uh, when we were in the communities there, we are looking at the parliament as an institution that is really going to check on the executive mm -hmm. and be able and to deliver. To him, I'm because to it has the <laughs> legislation <laughs> mandate, it has the oversight matter. mandate, the appropriation mandate. Now, who allocates the money? Unless you are trying to tell us that uh, you are just uh, there to rubber stamp things which are coming from somewhere. So we still we have a lot of hope. That's why last week we had a meeting with the, the Parliamentary Forum on Quality of Health that, okay, if the health sector is not funded en enough, mm -hmm. can the Parliament be able to allocate more resources? Maybe the, the Honorable will be able to tell us, does the Parliament really exercise its power? Do they have that legitimacy to allocate resources? Because that's one of the things that we are discussing these issues. But also we are trying to look at the, the overall situation. We have institutions. I would uh, want to inform the viewers that uh, in Toroko, when you look at uh, the schools, 50, uh, 45 percent of uh, the girls are dropping out. Mm -hmm. They do not complete. Why? They are getting married at an early age. And when we did an assessment, we discovered that uh, 45 percent are married before the age of 16. 
and uh, some, in fact, 30 percent of that, they are forced into marriage. What does it mean? At that age, they are not able to make their own informed choices. What we are seeing are the effects of child neglect, that young girls cannot take care of their children mm. in terms of shelter, in terms of food, in terms of uh, education and all of that. So but we is are that a problem <coughs> of government? Okay. It starts with the, what I was explaining. Mm. If you have a school where teachers are sitting on under the tree, where you, you have a school which has only four classrooms, mm. you have a school, you go and read the NRM manifest. Mm. It committed to provide a primary school per Paris. It committed to provide sanitary parties for girls. It committed to, to provide housing for teachers. Now, what is happening? That people are working pupils are walking long distances. Yeah, and we and actually did a, a, a they are, they are quite an extensive footage. Yes. Yeah, through, so through we are, we are seeing a trend yes, of yeah. effects mm -hmm. that by the time you see girls getting mad, they are looking at an option. Because the option of studying, they do schools are doing very badly. So we really need to look at a, a mechanism yeah. under which the government is able to allocate sufficient resources mm -hmm. to construct classrooms, yes. recruit teachers, have teachers' houses, because we have testimonies mm. from all the, the <coughs> communities. In fact, why is it that you have a penal code, the, the deferment law, but you find even the leaders are, are celebrating the, the early marriage? Yes, okay, so, so fantastic. So the interventions that are supposed so to be made, we're more funding, to, to highlight and make sure that the laws the actually that are yes. supposed to penalize. J just a second, mm. because you've uh, posed a certain question that mm. is very fundamental. He's mm. a representative of the government uh, function, mm. uh, the uh, legislative arm. Uh, so what, what, what is, you're sitting on the, on the parliamentary forum for quality health. Yes. So we need to understand what that forum actually does, how government, rather how parliament, is in collaborative um, uh, operations with the central government to make sure that there is an intervention in these areas to effectively get their rightly deserved services and goods. Thank you so much for, for a wonderful question. One, mm. our committee, our, our forum, uh, which, talk, which is all about quality health, our main role, we are advocates as mm -hmm. MPs. Mm. We are trying to liaise with the civil society organizations, mm -hmm. like our people here. We are trying to liaise with other MPs who are not on this committee, because in Parliament it is all to do with lobbying. Mm -hmm. We are trying to liaise with health committee, and I happen to sit on health committee as well, to make sure that the quality of care and the services given to Ugandans should be the best. So that is our major role as a forum. So we are advocates. We've been trying our level best to make sure that we bring, atten uh, we bring to attention our government to make sure that it, it knows what is on ground. But uh, uh, my fellow colleague posed a very good question that unless we are moving away from our main role mm. as members of parliament uh, uh, and we are only lamenting, mm. but I would ask, yes, I'm a member of parliament. And it's good you, you, you brought it out that you, you, you are very vocal. Every time you see me on TV, I will be talking on health issues yeah. and what. But they have even their members of parliament who are representing them. Mm. What are they doing? Is the government aware that this one is happening? Mm. For me, I'm yeah. doing my role mm -hmm. as a member <coughs> on, on, who, is, who sits on quality health forum mm. and as an MP of my area. But the challenge we have as legislators is mm. this. When the president visits mm -hmm. or any other official, we want to praise, we want to cover uh, and say we are doing well. In fact, we've come out from nothing. We are somewhere. Mm -hmm. We are not bringing matters that are affecting our own people. Mm -hmm. But what we've done, first and foremost, like we've patterned with the, uh, with the, the health committee. And at the moment, we've already... Um, we've already uh, finished drafting a motion which is intending to increase the health budget whereby we want to make sure that uh, um, some sectors mm -hmm. which have been affected by, which have, have been underfunded, like the blood bank, um, NMS, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that government should increase funding mm -hmm. 
100 mm. percent mm. and the motion is there we are supposed to table it last week mm. and the speaker gave us this week immediately after a short recess yeah so the honorable governor just in one minute if yes. you could uh, we we need to have an address of his specific concerns, especially for those pastoral areas. Is there a certain concrete focus that is being put on those uh, kind of unfortunate areas which have a very dispersed area of land, very uh, hard terrain to operate in, and a harsh climate? Is there a special focus that is put on it? Just one minute, Okay, please. thank you so much. Mm. Actually, to me, it has not, we've not been, we, they've not been having a special focus mm -hmm. because me i've been looking at health and education in the uh, national school. in the yes uh, mm -hmm. nationally mm -hmm. how how is the clear picture mm -hmm. for these sectors mm -hmm. and it is doing poorly mm -hmm. but now that it has come to our attention because mm -hmm. they engaged us last week mm -hmm. we need to see what we can do for example i did know that because of of um, because of uh, the geographical uh, terrain, terrain of, yes. of kasese mm -hmm. that even if you put an ambulance it will not work. Whether it is a motorbike ambulance, whether it will mm. not work. Okay. So even when they posed the question, I was even asking myself, that now, mm. what are we going to do in Kasese? Do we need to look at mm. electrified cable network that can take this? <laughs> okay, you know, yeah. just a pause on that. So yeah. now, let, let me first get to us, uh, we, we, we have time constraints here. So Simon, mm. okay. according to the second schedule of the Local Government Act 1997, which you are very familiar with uh, as a public service, the education and sports functions and services that are under the, juris are under the jurisdiction of the district and, of course, municipal councils. Mm. In the same act, local governments are charged with operational planning, management, and delivery of health services. So this is presumed that actually before you get all these resources, you plan, you do resource identification and uh, rather needs identification to solicit for resources. So help us just to understand the picture of how you generate interests or the needs for your communities, mm -hmm. how you get money. Uh, is that process involving to the local political representatives and people, how is it involving? How democratic is that process and how effective? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the planning process actually is, is very clear. Uh, we begin with uh, uh, getting the planning figures mm -hmm. from the center. Then we invite our politicians and the opinion leaders, other stakeholders in the budget conferences. These budget conferences are at the district level and at the lower local government levels. So it is through the budget conference that we, we collect the views of the people that we eventually integrate in the budget framework papers mm -hmm. that eventually uh, form the basis of the budget for a given finance year. So the, 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 the issues are there. But of course, uh, the IPFs have uh, limitations because there are some conditional monies that must be specifically for given activities. So. You have to plan within on how the, 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 the money has been allocated. For example, in Toroko, we have uh, a budget of around 9.5 billion. Mm. Out of this budget of 9.5 billion, 57% of this budget, above 57%, is wages. <laughs> that is ironical. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, is exactly a plan. that is bizarre. Is wages. So yeah. wages for so people who are doing what? Because if you're getting we wages... A service, we're extending okay. a service to the people. Because right. wherever the people are, the services must reach them. And the people who are delivering the services without actually the services being delivered get the money of that entire budget. Can you allow me to interject? I, I, let him first finish. I don't want to uh, yeah, be I was saying that of course, uh, mm. When we're talking about uh, health service, we have the health workers mm. in the health facilities. Okay. And health workers, they have to be paid when they, are, mm. they work. So you can't say that they and are just been, there. And it's been found in many reports that actually they are absent or they are actually mm. not w working because the other facilities which they require, like medical drugs, uh, rather mm. drugs themselves and the facilities they need to use, mm. they are not available. So they're not working, but yeah. they have a guaranteed payment, which is ridiculous. Yeah, in terms of uh, our facilities, you know, you know, the drugs come. Mm. We have uh, at least every two months the drugs are brought. And, uh, you know, people rush when they are, they are drugs. And, and, and receive medication. But in some instances, we have more than enough in some facilities mm -hmm. which can be transferred to other facilities if there's a need. Yeah, for example, the other day, the other day we got uh, uh, an inflow of refugees. We did immunization for them in Canada. Uh, then we had to get some more supplies from the health center for to ensure that the, the refugees are immunized so that our children are not uh, at risk. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. So because there's a controversy about uh, about <laughs> refugees. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, j just round up on especially is the system of how you get that money and how you are obliged to dispense it and of course dis uh, make sure that it is utilized. Is it effective enough, or are there certain things that need to be improved? Yes. Yes. The, the the system is effective because eventually the council has to approve the work plans and mm -hmm. approve the budgets uh, allocated the, to the various activities mm -hmm. in the work plan. And this is how we spend the money according to the activities planned mm -hmm. and the, uh, the money allocated. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in, <coughs> in, in primary, we have a total of around 12,715 mm -hmm. pupils. Mm -hmm. But when you say according to gender, we have 6,288 6, boys mm -hmm. against 6,427 girls. Mm -hmm. There is, you see the, the girls are slightly even more than yes, the but relatively balanced. Okay, yeah. uh, you, su you sound to be comfortable with the way the system is. Now let me just go for a break, Patrick. When I come mm -hmm. back, uh, definitely they, uh, we're going to just have a more robust discussion. Then wrap up this. And mm -hmm. I need you to help us advise the ordinary citizens. And perhaps something you wanted to note on mm -hmm. the earlier discussion. Advise citizens on what they need to do in this dilemma that we're facing. And thanks our viewers for keeping with us. This is NTV and Kamal Chule from the Campus International Conference Center. We'll be back after this short break. Thanks our viewers for keeping with us, I'm Kagawa Baldwins, and we're discussing very key issues as regards our development, especially in, the, in, in peculiar local communities like in Toroko and Kasese, which have a very terrible kind of difficult terrain, and the climate is harsh, and the, the people are still in a very pleasant economic status. Their social development is still low, and we're asking ourselves why and what should be done, actually, to improve that. So, Patrick, let me come to you. We, we shouldn't seem to uh, push all the responsibility and the burden on, of course, local authorities and government. The, the citizens themselves, local individuals there who are living in those communities, they need to be doing something. What do you advise that those communities do to ensure that actually they get what rightly belongs to them? Very interesting. The people are not <coughs> sleeping. They are doing something. In a case, when they were struggling to access education, uh, two people were eaten by a lion. What do you expect Sad. them to do? Can they chase it and hunt it when there is a government authority to do something? In, in Toroko, the mothers, they see walking that long distance. Instead, they are going to deliver from a church. You see, some decide to stay home. They go tra to traditional birth attendance. You know, you need to go back to the constitution. What does it say? Why do people go to vote? You know, they vote, they go to the elections to put into place a government that's going to deliver services. And these services are not delivered from somebody's um, pocket. You know, a leader only makes a decision in a public trust. Mm -hmm. They allocate resources from money collected from taxpayers. Now, what we are seeing, we are just basically sending a reminder. We have been doing awareness to educate people about their rights, and indeed they are coming out to demand. What is the effect? They are putting a lot of pressure to local governments. It's like, it's a skeleton. It's like a bull trying to milk a bull. You see, they are saying we can't construct a health facility. The policy says we need the health center three at sub county level, but it's not there. Drug stock out is a problem. Maybe Honorable will also answer, why is it that they are, they are going, the Ministry of Health is going to ban 1,500 tons of drugs when health, some health facilities are crying for lack of drugs. Are you doing your oversight mandate? That's where we have a problem. That at the, at the end of the day, there are things which the central government should be able to do. And in fact, from last week's discussion, we're trying to reflect, where is the problem? Does the executive have trust in what the parliament does? Can we be able, is it the the NRM chief whip who makes decision, is it about NRM caucus? He sits in mm -hmm. that NRM caucus. He's a member of NRM. They have very clear programs. Why is it that implementation is a problem? The cow here is very silent to say that indeed they, they are stuck. With the decentralization, more districts are being created to deliver services near to the people. 
we need to ask to interrogate this. Are we seeing real services to the people? And uh, health and education is at the core. When you look at the human uh, development index, you look at the human capital development when it comes to NRM, health and education is at the center. So people are going to continue engaging their leaders. But are the leaders responding? Are they delivering? This is where we need to come to the round table. Why is it very difficult for the permanent secretary and the minister of health, permanent secretary and the minister of education, secretary of the treasury, to come out to see this? You have seen some proposals come from parliament, but secretary of the treasury says no money. Mm -hmm. Is there a better understanding? When you look at the rural and the urban, there is a very big divide. Whereas you can use a formula of radius of five kilometers in urban areas, there are many private facilities mm. for both schools and health facilities. But when you go to the rural areas, the populace, you know, it's a wide area. People trek long distances, and they want to tell you, moderate, that people have been struggling to make a living. They grow their own crops, they take their own crops to, to the market, they earn their own money, they pay taxes, and what is coming out, that even where things are getting stuck, they get their own solutions. What are the solutions? They will marry off their daughters at the very younger age. They will exchange it for some little cows, for a little money. So we are asking, what is the government doing? When it, we have the deferment law, we have all these procedures, but no one is acting. Which institution should do the people trust in? How can we be able to engage? Now, so I you can feel say that actually the communities in or fact the people in there have engaged the system? And yes, uh, and we are continuing to engage. Mm -hmm. But we need to go back to the same laws that we have. If we say equality before the law, if we say that uh, no discrimination, and the question we're asking, why is it that in the pastoral communities, where from one house to another, people have to walk 30 kilometers to access a health facility? You don't see sense in that. When you are planning, wh how do you take it to be very normal that uh, in the entire country, uh, this is the radius mm -hmm. we want to use? But you still see that uh, the health facilities are not in those sub-counties. Mm -hmm. You go ahead not to have them, but also you know that uh, those areas, they are big problems. Okay. And people will mm -hmm. continue suffering. People will be... Uh, no, 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 I, I think mean, that we are shedding light to this matter. Yeah. So uh, there will be an improvement, I believe, so strongly. And the policymakers are actually watching and uh, engaging with this particular discussion. Now, uh, uh, Honorable uh, Gaffa, I can feel the combating spirit of, uh, of Patrick in this particular regard, and it seems the, gun, the guns are pointed at you. So we, we need to understand um, what Parliament is doing, especially in combating the corruption that is embedded in public service. The, of course, this is a wide area, because one of the, the there was a, a sitting, some kind of discussion that they had at Africana Hotel, and one of the MPs cited out that the, 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 the car or the district had been given about one billion uh, as a budget support for the development. But mm -hmm. at the end of the financial, that financial period, about 60% of that money actually had been either misappropriated or abused. So, what do we need to do to combat this corruption that is within the local government system itself? Not just the central government, but the local government system. And what are the recommendations in that regard? Uh, th thank you so much. But before we can think about maybe the local government, centrally, what are we doing as MPs? Mm. You've seen of recent through public accounts committee, where I also happen to sit, uh, where we've made the recommendations that uh, Honorable Matia Kasaija and uh, the PS uh, and the Secretary, to Treasur uh, the, the Secretary to Treasury, Keith Mahakanizi, actually should be one, uh, this Kasaija should be censured and Mahakanizi should be relieved of his duties. Mm. Uh, well, okay, uh, now that, uh, that uh, is uh, central uh, government. Yes, no, no, but yes I'm coming there. Yes. I, I, but we are trying to find that is corruption. Public realm. But do you know, yes, do you we know what is happening? Mm. Our, my own party, actually convened the caucus meeting uh, um, and it was chaired by government chief whip and they were telling members of parliament of NRM to protect Honorable Matia Kasaija 
mm. not to be censured. Yeah, I, and so, I can't, dis okay, honorable yes. guys, I, I can't discuss politics because if I actually put on the, the, the gun shots of uh, discussing politics here, yeah, we will not finish. So what can so we I, do on, yes, local, on local government corruption and misappropriation of funds? Just as an advice. I, I think, yes. Because there is tremendous government money misuse in the local communities, live alone, the, because the central government is a different issue and it's all in the public media, rather in public realm. Now, local government, if this gentleman is accused of actually misappropriating money, how do we make sure that that does not recur? Thank you so much. I think uh, even councillors, uh, maybe from uh, legislation, we need to make some new laws that someone who is to, to, uh, to actually to, s to seek for uh, an office of becoming a councillor mm -hmm. at a district mm -hmm. should be uh, of a certain, uh, should be at a certain level of education. For example, maybe senior six. Because I, I'm just looking at district, we have also public accounts committee. Mm -hmm. These people are supposed even to see, to track what the, uh, the, the, the local governments, the cows are doing. But you can imagine a, a, a P1 graduate supervising a cow who has a master's. So I, I think uh, we need to make sure that that one is put in place. Then the, 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 the councillors there, we need to go back and sensitize them mm -hmm. and see it is their role before an MP comes on board, have they brought these matters to the attention of their MPs to know that there is something which, which is filthy that we can clean? Mm -hmm. From there, I think we shall try to fight corruption. And even people who are given jobs, some of, it is a fact, some of them are, are even rewarded for, for, for having maybe participated in other things. So we need to make sure that they've even the procedures of bringing some people in, in, in certain positions, like maybe cow and what, they are uh, the way how they, are, they, they assume offices, we need to check and mm. see how did they come up. Mm. Because we need to put people in office who are morally upright. Yeah, and that is subjective. But uh, good submission, of course. Uh, so, Simon, we, we need, because there is too much that is uh, alleged or perhaps it comes as evidence against local government money handlers and, of course, local government officials, that money is misappropriated. What... what causes this? Is this the truth? What is the situation in Toroko? Are there are measures to protect public money. Do you utilize public money appropriately uh, as regards to the budgets that are, uh, are funded? Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Just two minutes and we uh, wrap up. Mm. As, a, as a, uh, an accounting officer, mm -hmm. you know, money is spent according to the activities planned for mm -hmm. in the budget. So that allegation on that money is a blanket misappropriated, I think is not appropriate, may mm. not apply. Because like yeah, but there are processes. We've been seeing mischarges and environments There are auditor general mm. uh, yes. reports that have been yes. made, so we cannot yeah, go into that are, area. We need to understand, are you protecting the local yes. government, your local government money, that yes, especially is representing, is supposed to be done in the development of Ntoroko district? Yes, yes we are. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the, for example, Take a case of education. Uh, my SFG grant, this mm. is for development, is 97 million. And here you go and do some, some toilet, some renovation. Uh, the, 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 the. And this process has to go through uh, the procurement process at the district. Uh, 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 a best bidder is identified, then the bidder carries out the, the implementation. Mm -hmm. So this is how <coughs> money is channeled. Because you don't just pick money and give it to an individual officer mm. to, to, to go and implement. No. So the processes are clear and can be tracked in that way. Through so the public procurement yeah. and disposal uh, law system. Yes, it okay. works. It works. All right. Uh, I just need us to wrap up this. Our time has mm. really run out. So le le let me start with you. Okay, just Simon again. Mm. Your parting shots that I come to Patrick and I end with... Uh, what is your parting shot on this issue? How do we push Ntoroko and Kasese forward to be better and for people to enjoy their public right services? That yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Of course, uh, as the uh, pastoral communities and in Toroko and Kasese, mm -hmm. but Toroko is more of hard to reach. You know, uh, the nearest distance my civil servant at the district travel every morning is 26 kilometers. And you know, in, in the policy, the hard to reach allowance so is only paid to rural sub counties. Town mm -hmm. councils assume to have all the best facilities. Mm -hmm. So you see, the, 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 
there's a need to adjust that policy. Because if the, 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 the public servants, actually the whole of Ntoroko, need to be declared as hard to reach. Because mm -hmm. there's no one enjoying any uh, 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 comfort there. Because mm -hmm. yeah. some people have to travel as far as Fort Porto, mm -hmm. look for accommodation and, and stay. Okay, so, thank you. So there are those challenges. So there so needs to be special focus on yes. those particular areas and... Uh, Consider the whole district yes. has had it reached okay. so that eventually people can be motivated. Because I'm finding it a problem even transferring teachers. True. Moving from a town in council, <coughs> uh, from a rural sub county bring to the town council, they don't want that. True. To become, okay. Because uh, people would enjoy at least working in mm. the rural sub counties. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Patrick. Um, when you look at the NRM manifesto, which was developed in 2016, we are only remaining with a few years now. Yes. To 2021. And I'm wondering when are those commitments going to be implemented? Because that was the social contract which NRM got with the students of Uganda. Now, for me, I'm looking at the interaction between the executive and the parliament to make sure that the services are able to reach. On the, on the legislation, we do want to see parliament now come up with a law that is going really to address these um, inequalities. Mm -hmm. That the people in the pastoral communities, you are able to give them special attention mm -hmm. if you need affirmative action. Yeah, we do want to see <coughs> an appropriation mandate where through budgeting you are able to allocate more money to the health and the education sectors mm -hmm. to address the infrastructure gap, to uh, be able to address uh, issues of, of drugs, but also the drugs, it has a very strong problem. Mm -hmm. But it, it comes back to the oversight mandate. How do they exercise their oversight mandate? They are not even monitoring their own NRM commitments, not the health policy. Because when you read them, you see everything is very good, very clear. Mm -hmm. Why is it that there is no seed secondary school in every sub count as yeah. per commitment? Why is it that there is no primary school? Why is it that there is no health center three? Because people wouldn't be suffering. So the yeah. students of Uganda oh, yeah. are, are committed to continue engaging. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't leave it to engage the authorities at the district because we, everyone has been crying. By the way, moderator, I want to tell you this. Yeah. From the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone is lamenting. <laughs> True. I and like Patrick, I, I will <laughs> unfortunately, we're also lamenting now. Uh, time has caught up with us. And yeah. Honorable Gaffa, it's very unfortunate. I'm not going to have uh, a run of your response. Uh, but we will have to arrange perhaps another day. We are time, uh, time out. And uh, so, Mr. Mzinduki, uh, Patrick, uh, the, mm. uh, the, the, the governor, government policy and advocacy head of mm. KRSC, you've yes. done such tremendous work. And I advise, mm. please, if you want to curiously find out what these people do go on their website. It's very elaborate. They've done so many mm -hmm. things in that region. And Honorable Mbwate Kamwa uh, Gaffa, I apologize that I couldn't bring you in because we are time a uh, bad. And Simon uh, Bimbona, Chief Administrative Officer of Ntoko District. Gentlemen, thank you indeed for being on this show. It's been okay. resplendent. Okay. Uh, very insightful, but we cannot uh, proceed on much with this. And I believe people who are watching, policy makers, please, you take action to help improve these areas. I'm Karagawa Baldwin, and I'll be coming back here on Friday evening at 10 p.m. same time to discuss actually still same area, like I say, especially the big cats, animals, and the plight that they face. They are actually being threatened into extinction. Please keep logged on to NTV. God bless. <laughs>